Hello, everybody, and welcome to our uh, Orca Books Co-op's virtual reading and discussion of Lisa Gassner's new book of poetry, What's My Address? Uh, we have Lisa here today to share their work and talk about their poetry with us, so maybe, you know, a little more. Um, Lisa will be reading from their collection. Uh, after the reading, uh, there might be a little discussion uh, and some more stuff that they got planned with uh, Lisa and their friends. Uh, please keep your mics muted until the end when I... Uh, you, you will know when it's time to turn them on. Um, uh, when it's time for questions, raise your hand. You'll be called on to be unmuted and all that. Uh, so from the back of their book, I'm going to read a little introduction. Uh, in, in, their, in their book writing debut, Lisa Gassner paints a matriarchal Midwest portrait of a poor and working class upbringing uh, of displacement and determination. What's my address is an honest question that puts oral history to paper. The book is a love ritual that allows the grown-up Lisa an opportunity to express, tend, and heal childhood traumas while tapping into the freedom felt being a young kid in the 70s and 80s. Lisa Ganser is a white, queer, bipolar, brain-injured, non-binary, formerly unhoused poverty scholar, an organizer, an artist who tends to Squaxin in a squally land, they currently live in love in so-called Olympia, Washington, with their partner, Nomi Lamb. They're a cop watcher, a dog walker, a sidewalk chalker, and the daughter of a mama named Sam. Lisa, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nora. Thanks so much to Orca Books. Um, I am like almost in tears looking at all these people, uh, so many people from different facets of my life, some of my... Uh, my brother's here, I'm seeing just so many people. Uh, Talana, just like, thank you everybody for being here. I'm surrounded by a little group of people, a little inner circle. Uh, so I'm so grateful all these people are here. Um, I did write a book and um, I'm gonna read from it. But uh, what I am gonna be doing is I've invited in a couple of people to open us up and close us out in a prayerful way. And so the first person that is going to uh, uh, participate um, is my friend Tamika Green, and she is going to be sharing some prayer uh, in Lashutsi, yes. the original language, and probably introduce yourself a little bit too. There you go. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tamika. I'm from the Squaxin Island uh, Reservation. Um, yes, so I would like to say a prayer um, in the Lashutsi language. Um, and uh, my Indian name is Diade. I forgot something. I knew I forgot some, but yes. My Indian name is Diade. Um, and uh, that actually means beaver. And it comes from the um, Quilu tribe, which I am also from, um, have some family from over there as well. So <clears throat> there's a squadade of Chad Twalti Slechel. A squadade of Chad Twalti Sleejus. A squadade of Chad Twalti Tsali. A squadade of Chad Twalti Buckstab. Quaby teed Hutch, Quaby teed Zokwab, Quaby teed Sali. Who you chest a stacho, Chadish, a scobulo, all tea sleejus. Oh, Mazista. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Hey everyone, thank you for being here. I am going to read the first piece from my book called What's My Address, which is out on Poor Press. And it's a piece called Long Lines. <sighs> long Lines. I come from Long Lines, Norway, Austria, Ireland, of people who came, escaping violence and poverty, and who took, sacrificing so that I could even write a book. Cutting across lands through neighborhoods like a sharp, familiar knife in search of safety and opportunity and a better white life. I am living to unlearn the entitlement of mine while having been evicted at least a dozen times. I used to think I couldn't keep one house plant alive if I had a house for a plant and even if I really tried and that I'd die by suicide. At 52 years old, I'm surrounded by living, loving plant medicine guides, going back to them from where I came, in line behind mothers, femmes, ancestors, earth, there for me like they have been since even before my birth. My fair weathered hands are in dark, wet, wormy, well-tended soil. 
A blueberry that I grew explodes in my mouth. I smell cedar so strong under branches like long arms swooping so far down, they kiss the ground, some even taken root, raising back up again to the sky. I think about my ancestor mama, Sam, her strength, her wisdom, her trauma, her laugh lines, my punch lines, our bloodlines, production lines, deadlines, lifelines, front lines, factory lines, worry lines, welfare lines, queer lineage, transestors, disabled ancestors, my brother, I can see him right there. Tending this patch of rent to own land is now my life's work in this one level accessible, just maybe forever home on this squawks and turtle island earth. Thank you. I read a piece. I feel a little bit more relaxed. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, everyone. I'm going to continue and read a couple more pieces. And then um, Nomi's going to be sharing some links, I think, in the chat so you can watch for that. And there I see Laura Love. Hey, thank you. Um, I, uh, I think I will read a piece called, uh, let's see. If there's any requests, you can put them in the chat as well. Uh, if it's all right with you, Marty, is it okay if I read uh, My Brother Was Born? Is that all right with you? Cool. All right. I did dedicate this book to my brother. The dedication reads, a gift for my brother and friend, Marty, so you know that you are loved and that you exist. From current me to older me to remember. So this is a way for me to remember these stories that I tell often. <sighs> Deep breath. My brother was born. I learned the beginnings of how to be a people protector by being three and having a younger brother be born. We were raised together, played together for the first 10 years of his life with our mom. Bunk beds, played with cars, building out cityscapes in the dry sandlot of the apartment's front yard, whole city. Having sword fights with the cardboard from inside the big wrapping paper rolls at Christmas, slapping each other silly with them till the cardboard swords turned into flappy flailing cords. Jumping on beds, laughing so hard, our mom let us do it, that shit was the best. Playing kick the can, hide and seek, soccer, football after dark with all the different neighborhood kids in all the different neighborhoods. We had so much freedom, an entire adventurous existence outside of whatever place was home. In parks, in the woods, in the sun, in the snow, under stars. Just be with an earshot and get home when and if our mother yells our names, Marty, Lisa. He liked the TV on kind of loud in the other room at night if no grown-ups were around. I would leave the door ajar so he could sleep. I kept creeps away from him so he could stay asleep. He did not like mayonnaise or anything that resembled mayonnaise he did not like any of the foods touching each other when they were on his plate. I had to be the bad guy to make sure shit got done. I made sure we got to school early, which he hated, for free breakfasts, which came with the free lunch program. Sometimes those were the only meals we had, so I didn't care if he got mad. I did a rhyme there, just wanted to point it out. <laughs> he helps me relax a little. Megan Lowe's funny, it's okay. We played school long before he was even in school, meaning I made him do my homework. <laughs> Thank you. And while that made me the short-term winner, it made my younger brother smart, smarter than me, reading from the dictionary at age three, seriously. I'm not making that shit up, ask him. <laughs> we used to play a game, I'm not sure if I made it up or if some older kid taught it to me called Trip where I would have my brother going past me back and forth, trying to get by without getting tripped. Truth is you can pretty much trip the person every time, <laughs> but you cat and mouse and let them get by so they think they're winning. Then lift their legs out from under them for a hard ass fall. I really thought that shit was funny. Years later, my mom pointed out how in all the pictures of us as little kids that survived the evictions, I mean the pictures, it's a miracle we have photos at all. It's so sweet, Legs, how you always have your arm around little Marty. Look, every single picture my mom celebrated. It wasn't every picture and dang, she was right. It was most of them. I hadn't noticed 
I'm so grateful she showed me that. On another occasion, I was yucking it up about how great it is to be an oldest child and pick on your little brother. Don't let anyone else beat him up except me. Ha, 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 I laughed. A friend pointed out from their youngest child perspective how ignorant and not funny that is. And I shut my trap. I was like, damn. Later, I brought this up to Marty. I could see by his expression that he wasn't ready for this conversation and that I had in fact caused him harm. And I felt my heart drop in my chest. I couldn't joke my way out of this. As an older sibling and a child who protected and cared, I was also mean and a bully to my brother. I wish I could take that back, but there's no take backs. I sure am grateful that my brother Marty was born. I would not have survived without him. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll read one more and then maybe uh, then I'll talk about some stuff. I'm going to read a piece called Walk Down to Kmart to Buy Some Shoes. And this is not an advertisement for Kmart. <laughs> Unless they want to send me some money. Like, go ahead. I'll take the money. All right. <laughs> I talk about my brother a lot. Hi, Marty. I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Andrea. <laughs> My younger, brother, my younger brother lost a shoe. I have no idea how a kid could lose just one. Shoes are usually together, like my brother and I were. We gathered up loose change, coins in the couch cushions and chairs, checked every pocket of every clothes or jacket. A couple bucks from mom and we headed to the mall. I made up a song as I often did to pass the time or make things fun. Influenced by TV, our babysitter, and top 40 music to the tune of Eddie Grant's Electric Avenue, a song I know now is about black uprising and the violence of poverty. We're gonna walk down to Kmart to buy some shoes and then we'll go to Northtown. That was our song. We sang that song silly over and over and all the way home. Two and a half miles is a long way for a kid only wearing one shoe. And so, that's a short piece, thank you. All right, so here we are together. Um, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to share this with you all, especially this month. It's my birthday month, so I'm gonna be 53. Um, I'm also celebrating a landmark in my um, sobriety. Um, I have five years in a row, which is pretty exciting for me as a harm reductionist and a person that um, is abstaining from uh, alcohol. So I'm just excited to share uh, this during this month actually those things this being my birthday is what made it okay for me to do this because i was feeling a little like self-conscious i like doing things where there's a bunch of people and i'm one guy but today it's my guy and i see corinne ah, hey thank you um and so uh if you do not have my book uh which is the one i'm holding right here and reading from it is available at orca books in store and you can also get it at poorpress.net which nomi uh, might share in the in the chat and um, one of the things I've been asking people is, uh, as a love ask, is if you can afford to buy my book, I ask you that you might buy more than one, that you might buy more, more than one book. There are so many good books. The Homefulness Handbook, this is a collaborative effort and it's a poor and indigenous people's solution to, to homelessness, homefulness. It's like how to build your own homefulness. And um, it's by the Poverty Scholars of Poor Magazine and how to not call the police ever. That's a great book as well. Um, that's a good book. Black Disabled Ancestors by Leroy Moore. That is also an awesome book on poor press. The Poor People's Survival Guide to COVID-19. I, I didn't practice this, I'm very thirsty. Mm. Yes. How to, how to Survive COVID-19 and the Virus of Poverty. So many awesome books. There's a few books here too that were in the same cohort. Uh, this book was written because I, uh, Oh, it was a part of, uh, I've been a part of Poor Magazine for about eight years or nine years, something like that. Yeah, probably eight. Probably eight. And um, I went to people school, which is something I highly recommend folks do. Anyone with any kind of, um, uh, all poverty scholars should go, but, and also anyone with any kind of, um, I'm forgetting the word here, I'm nervous. Class privilege? Yeah, class, class privilege, race privilege, 
skin privilege, education privilege, any kind of privilege. Um, I always qualify, obviously, because I'm a white person. And as a poverty scholar, I also got to join as a writer. Um, and so we were, we were in this writing during COVID-19. It was so nice to be able to um, connect with other poverty scholars and be in a writing group. And so seven books, I think, came out of that writing group and my book was one of them. And I uh, definitely will say that I think my book was finished. Yeah. Just kidding. No, I never said that. <laughs> Nomi said the best. Thanks, Nomi. Um, yeah. uh, that I finished it because I'm housed. So I'm just going to say that. So there are some folks that um, we we pushed the date out because we were having to accommodate um, folks. And um, anyway, I'm just so grateful I was in that writing group. And uh, Sidewalk Motel is in that writing group. That's by Tiny, uh, Tiny Gray Garcia. And Tiny is the person who is the original poverty scholar. So she came up with that idea uh, that uh, it's more of a way to, um, an empowering way to think about having experienced poverty uh, because we know the most about it because we experienced it. It's like, uh, you know, for us, by us kind of thing. And uh, I know that Tiny will credit her mama D and their ancestors uh, for, for po poverty scholarship. There's also a book called Poverty Scholarship, which I suggest as well. And here's a book by Audrey Candycorn, Opened Iraq. I'm just going to show a few more. Chamali by Mutiado Silencio mm -hmm. and Crip Lyrics by Valvira. So I'm suggesting some more books. And um, if you go to the website and you think, oh, these other books look better than Lisa's, buy those. <laughs> and if, you're, if you want the book and you can't afford it, uh, that we take care of you there too. I have some mm -hmm. copies here at the house for Poverty Scholars for no, no charge. And at Poor Press, they always send books to people uh, experiencing poverty that can't afford them. So there's that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a lot of me talking. Um, hmm, should I read some more? Or should I open it up? Or um, read some more. Read some more. Thanks. I'm so glad Nomi's here. Thank you, Nomi. I love you. I love you too. Nomi, uh, I did this artwork on the cover, and Nomi did all of the, the graphic design work and chose the font and helped me lay it out and help me keep it reeled in. It was also my editor, which is very helpful um, because you know I don't have an editor right now, as you can see. So <laughs> in the book, there was an editor. It's a little bit more palatable, perhaps. I don't know. I'm just uh, looking at myself while I talk. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I am just like, I, if I look at all the people who are here, I'm like, hello, I'm just like gonna start crying. Hi, Kelly, oh my goodness. <laughs> Diane, Andy, oh, look at that. <laughs> Okay, I, and some neighbors and some folks uh, from the anti-police terror community. I see Jack, I see Ben Lucal, I see, like, anyway, I can't name everyone, but um, I can tell you who I can name, me. And this is my book. No, I'm just kidding. I'm Lisa Gaz. I'm Lisa Gaz. I'll be here all week. And when I say all week, I mean W-E-A-K. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so, okay, I'm going to read again. I'm going to read things. Oh, you wanted me to read Jerry's Leftovers. Yeah, yeah. I haven't read this one publicly. Mm -hmm. It's called Jerry's Leftovers. It's a little bit longer. Okay. Is that Kim? Is that Kim, my cousin? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure, but I just saw that um, Tawana is requesting my mom's voice. Okay, cool. I will read that one. Thank you, Tawana. <laughs> Tawana, who helped uh, me, uh, we did it together. We held down a... Um, yeah, hosted, I can't remember the name of that venue that they stole from us, but uh, um, we had a poverty scholarship book club for a while, and I'm looking forward to holding Talana's books. Talana is working on some coloring books that are going to um, be liberating for young people um, and activity books. Um, anyway, I'm going to read. I, I love you, Talana. Thank you. And I think maybe running for office again. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I see a yes, okay. So that will give me some life's work to do, which Talana does quite often, thank you. <laughs> Helps me, uh, keep me busy. All right, Jerry's leftovers. We lived with him a long time. He was a bass player in a local Moundsview rock band. I remember one of the bands he was in was called Sluggo, like the villain from Mr. Bill on SNL. That's how my mom met him when his band was playing. <laughs> When his band was playing at a bar, The Mermaid, he was popular, ran with the crew, guys from his bands, guys on motorcycles, the people who bought drugs from him. 
I think my dad dislocated his thumb on my mom's face over it. Jerry and my mom hooking up, I mean, at the mermaid. Jerry had long red hair, handlebar mustache, extremely tall. His favorite TV show was MASH, which I hated. He always got first pick of the TV shows, so I've seen every episode. There were things we always had, we always had when Jerry was around. We always had Bacardi, fixing it, two liter bottles of Coke. Jerry did not like ice cubes from a tray, so we mostly always had ice cubes from the store, in the freezer, in a bag. So many things for grown-ups and not for us. Almost always there was a massive pile of weed and a big old school scale. Back then there, there was stems and seeds. We didn't always have food, but Jerry was the weed man. Mm. Borrowing a cup of sugar would advance to borrowing a sandwich. You gotta be really nice and super exhaustingly performative and swallowing your pride to borrow food, especially if you never made good on the loan. Jerry really liked American Chinese food, chicken chow mein, pork fried rice, chicken egg foo young, egg rolls. He would come home with these huge brown bags with the receipt stapled to them. Smelled so freaking good. In those cool white paper pails with the wire handles, always extra rice. Sometimes, just sometimes, Marty and I would get the leftovers, if there were any, usually not. Those sometimes when we got Jerry's leftovers, it would often just be the brown egg foo young gravy and white rice. And that was so delicious. Yes, Adding, <laughs> seriously, just warm it up. Add in water, stretch it a little further. Marty and I would be in our own ritual, especially the first week or two of the month, because that meant food stamps brought us groceries. Taking turns from meal to meal, cutting the frozen pizza in half, then the other guy gets to pick which half they want. If you're the cutter, you work real hard making sure those portions are equal. If there were more kids around, it meant making more portions. We ate a lot of Campbell's soup and hamburger helper back then, sometimes with hamburger. <laughs> Toward the end of living with my mom and Jerry, around the time when they found a way to turn food stamps into money into drugs and Chinese food, was when, uh, when I was in sixth and seventh grade, they stopped looking for small apartments to get kicked out of and advanced to duplexes to get kicked out of. Bigger places with basements and garages, fancy neighborhoods, neighborhood kids with Atari and expensive off-road bicycles. Bigger homes meant more roommates, lots of what nosy neighbors and cops would call traffic. The place, the big place meant Jerry's band could practice there. That sounds cool and it really wasn't. We were the party house, dude practicing his keyboard part with a metronome to Supertramp's bloody well right <laughs> all night long. <laughs> I don't remember any conversations with Jerry. When I think of him, I do see his smile. He never tried anything. It sucks that I have to say that about men. They kept late nights. When I was 30, I was in Amsterdam for a film festival, using a passport for the very first time, surrendering my linear sobriety for free drinks on the plane, Bacardi Cokes. At a cafe, I watched my friend roll a crappy joint. How could I, someone who had never been high, be a judger of a joint like that? I had avoided weed, I was mad at it. After watching another sloppy joint be rolled, I surprisingly offered a service I did not know that I had. I started rolling perfect joint after perfect joint. <laughs> like a perfect joint making machine. Like a perfect... Rolling them so tight between fingers and thumbs, I was detailed and quick, even given a twist to the ends. Mm -hmm. I rolled every drop of marijuana in sight. <laughs> Which didn't make me popular either, by the way. Um, my friend was kind of shocked. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> Thanks, <Yeah>. Jerry. <laughs> Is Stephanie Japs on this call? Because uh, that's who I was with in Amsterdam, but maybe she's not. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. Um, oh, yeah, we had a request. My mom's voice, right? Okay. Thank you, Solana. 
Okay, this piece is called My Mom's Voice on page 21 if you're following along at home or at the table. Oh, look, Donna has it. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Mom, my mom's voice had a rugged texture. Damn, I miss it. She's one of the few people I would say was a tough broad. There aren't many people I would call a tough broad. Wait, I would also call her mom a tough broad and her mom's mom a tough broad. I come from a line of tough broads. <laughs> when I was a baby, my mom recorded her voice reading books. She would play them at night. Those recordings put me right to sleep for a number of years. Marty too. I can't hear them in my head when I try to remember, but I can feel how it felt, how held I felt just to listen. My mom's young voice talking so sweet, reading little kid books without actually being there. I really wish I still had those mom books on tape. We would watch the Muppet show together and my mom would do all the voices. She was good at them too. Derpity derp, ort, ort. She would do the Swedish chef. My mom was so funny. She laughed at my jokes. She let us watch Saturday, Saturday Night Live from the very first season. It was especially fun if she was home watching it with us. When I came out, my mom joined P Flag. She told me and some of my friends a joke. What do you call a lesbian dinosaur? My mom asked. I thought for a moment, because I should know. <laughs> lick a lot of puss she said and busted out laughing i got a lot of mileage out of that joke and i always footnote her <laughs> my mom's laugh even her giggle hearty and deep raspy she had us buying her cigarettes from a young age sending us with a note up the street to the corner store saratoga's marty reminded me not yet the Marlboro 100 soft pack. Later, she was always quitting smoking, ordered by the doctor at home on oxygen, chain smoking capris, which are quite possibly the world's skinniest cigarettes. <laughs> the little box with the most pink on it. Legs on your way here, could you pick up some smokes? She'd ask. It was hard to say no. Damn, I miss her laugh. I feel like she's here, she's with us. There yeah. was another request. There was. Yeah, it's for thank you Auntie care care. Thank you Auntie care care. I can do that. Who who made the request? Um, let's see. It is Diane and. Oh, nice, nice. Thank you. All right. Let's see. What's really great is there's a table of contents, which is very makes it very easy to find mm -hmm. the different pieces because Nomi made that. <laughs> thank you, Nomi. You're welcome. Um, thank you Auntie care care. Right there, page thirty one. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We're halfway in. He's like halfway done. You got this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Shante Needham for sending me this shirt. Uh, Sandy still speaks. My mom went by Sandy when she was young, but this shirt is actually for Sandra Bland, who um, is a black loved one who was killed by the police in custody. Um, and these shirts. Uh, uh, Sandra Bland's sister, uh, Shante Needham is, is selling them. So if you're curious about getting them, I think you can find it online by just Googling that stuff. Um, but uh, Sandra Bland's um, and Angelversary uh, was just a couple of days ago, seven years without Sandra Bland on this planet. Uh, now she's one of our, our black ancestors. Uh, so I'm sending love to Sandra Bland's family and thanks uh, for this t-shirt um, so I could wear it today. And shares the same name as my mom, you know. Uh, my mom went by Sam and also we say her name one more time, Sandra Bland. Okay, 30. Thank you, Auntie Care Care. Great request. Everyone's picking the long ones. Oh, those are two pages. We're okay. We're okay. We're gonna be okay. Oh, <laughs> okay. These are bifocals, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Lean into those adaptive devices. Don't be, oh, if you need it, it's, they're helpful. And I look cute. Right, babe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Auntie Care Care. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna conjure up another ancestor here. All right. My dad had his own place at some point in a big apartment complex just on the other side of so called Minneapolis. 
I say so-called now because it truly is Anishinaabe territory. I think it was close to the city because I have a memory of riding in a car at night, mesmerized by the repetition of the freeway streetlights overhead and feeling happy. My dad knew all the building's names in the skyline. The Fauché Tower was one he would talk about. He was so excited, so excited to take us up into the IDS Tower, which at the time was the tallest building in the Twin Cities skylines. He always pointed out the IDS Tower. Later in life, my dad told me a story. He was coming back into town from being on the road and was comforted to be welcomed back by his beloved Minneapolis skyline. Then, oh my God, Lisa, I see there in the distance, one of the buildings was on fire, my dad told me. I almost crashed looking to see which building it was, but I couldn't tell. I made it to your grandma's and started making some calls, letting everybody know that there was a building in flames in downtown Minneapolis. I was shocked nobody had heard what was going on. Came to find out there wasn't a burning building at all. It was a new big obnoxious skyscraper, the Norwest building, which later became the Wells Fargo building, which is all lit up bright with yellow lights and definitely not on fire. I thought it was so funny that my dad panicked and mistook a new building for one burning up and then he had made such a big deal about it. I also liked that my dad was wrong. <laughs> I used to joke with him late into adulthood, teasing him the way he would the way he would give other folks a hard time. Whoa, dad, what's that big yellow building on fire? <laughs> He'd shoot me a look. Both my dad and I like giving people shit. Making people laugh, joke tellers, storytellers. We got to my dad's apartment. The building was fancy and big and other family members were there. My cousin Kim, my aunt Karen, other cousins and uncles. I think my dad had a roommate at the time and maybe this occasion was someone's birthday. The apartment complex had lots of, peop lots of young people living there and my dad seemed to be friendly with all of them. There was a workout room, outdoor patios where he could have a barbecue and an indoor swimming pool. Even though it was nice outside, the pool seemed awesome. So my cousin Kim and I went in. My Aunt Karen made sure there was always someone older with us. After all, I could not swim. Mm. I was walking back and forth across the pool, getting further and further toward the deep end. I was kind of bounce walking, teasing down the hill beneath me as I got further and further away from safely being able to keep my head above water. My toes now just barely touching the bottom, crisscrossing back and forth across the pool's width, bouncing me back up to breathe. At some point, I slipped a little too far, and when I put my toe down, all I hit was water, and I panicked. What was once me up high taking a deep breath now filled my lungs with water. The bobbing up and down continued as I tried desperately to get myself up above water to breathe. With each effort, I sucked only water. I saw these two older kids on the edge of the pool, their legs dangling. I was like, help! But I made no sound. I was screaming, doggy paddling with all my might, only to use up every bit of energy I had. I saw my uncle Mike. He didn't stop what he had been doing the whole time, diving from the diving board over and over. I was trying so hard to save myself and completely failing. My life started flashing before my eyes. I saw my mom holding me shortly after I was born. I saw her accidentally grab on a metal spoon instead of a wooden spoon and spanking my bare toddler ass with it, then being so regretful afterwards about my bruised ass. Mm -hmm. I saw memory after memory that I would not know today had it not been for this near-death experience. I wasn't done yet, what the hell? I then felt calm come over me as I gave up. I let death take me. My auntie Care Care told me when she came in, Mike was still diving and I was lifeless at the bottom of the pool. She dove in and pulled me out unconscious and started pounding on my back and doing everything she could to revive me. Suddenly pulled from afterlife's comforting arms, I hacked up chlorine water and breathed a deep, painful, life-giving breath. My aunt Karen picked me up and carried me two flights back to my dad's apartment. My arms were around her neck. She was holding me like a baby. I looked up at my dad's only sister, a woman who would later help raise me. And I said, thank you, Auntie Care Care. <laughs> that night in the apartment, I got anything I wanted. 
And I remember eating powdered donuts. <laughs> My throat was raw and pained. Later in life and still true today, I'm unable to eat powdered donuts without my whole body mm. reacting. Oh, powdered wow. donuts. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Auntie Care Care. Yes. <laughs> I was just thinking about how uh, when we were in uh, so-called Minneapolis, uh, in the Minneapolis area for my mom's, uh, uh, when my mom's like going, uh, like, what did we call it? Yeah, no, it wasn't memorial. really a funeral. It was a memorial, yeah. And um, Andrea and Marty and Nomi and I, planned it and took care of things together as a, as a team. Uh, and at that memorial service, Karen was there. My auntie Karen was there. She has left to join the ancestors, uh, ancestors since then. But Nomi, when Nomi met Karen, oh, it was so, so sweet. And Nomi was like, you're auntie Karen Karen? Thank you for saving Lisa. <laughs> and this was before I wrote the book. And I was like, and she was like, who, me? And she was like, yeah, you saved her. Thank you. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> thank you and i'm like you did you did she's like i didn't do anything i'm like you yeah. literally saved me from drowning <laughs> let alone like raised me for many years like let me live with you oh, fed me cooked me food so many things anyway um bought me makeup for the first time which i did not know how to wear i was in like the seventh grade and i had this like orange line going around so I, Oh, this might be a good time for the um, shaving story. Oh, okay. This might be a good time for the shaving story. <laughs> Trying to be cool. Trying to be cool. All these heavy things, we should have some laughter. All right. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I did makeup wrong in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> someone made fun of me in the locker room they're like you're looking that line and i'm like what are you talking about and they're like turn your head and i'm like i was like holy shit yeah if you straight, i'm like if i looked if everyone looked at me straight on i looked great you know what i'm saying if i just walked around like this like, yeah, my face looks great anyway so i feel like that's one of the main reasons i don't even wear makeup and that's stop oh, wearing right. it because it's too it's too much work it's too much work yeah look all, all over mm. <laughs> yeah Yes. Yes. Nobody <laughs> should be forced to wear makeup. Yes. Nobody yes. should be forced. Thank yes. you to those who do. You look great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your makeup. Okay. What am I reading again, babe? I'm um, trying to be cool. Trying to be cool. Page mm. 23 of the book. What's my address? Thank you, everyone. <laughs> trying to be cool. It's only two pages. <laughs> i like knowing things you know like if you go if you're going to watch someone's yeah. like here watch my movie and yeah. i'm like okay how long is it i mean what is it an hour and a half is it two minutes is it five minutes 30 seconds like i want to know <laughs> two pages Get it. trying to be cool which i'm obviously doing right now sorry about that <laughs> I haven't uh, learned shit. I will, I keep, I will, keep, I will keep learning. <laughs> Thank goodness there's nothing but better days of learning. Okay. Mm, trying even cooler. Trying to be cool. <laughs> By me, Lisa Ganza. Okay. I got it in my head that I should shave my legs, mm. even though there was nothing much to see. Other girls at school were talking about it. My mom was in the living room, surrounded by people and music and laughter and drinks. I had already put Marty to bed. My mom had brought up shaving to me before, and I was a hard no. So I figured she'd be excited because girl stuff. <laughs> Hell yeah, legs, my mom said, all playful and excited. My mom's nickname for me was legs. She said it was because my legs were so long. I liked it when she called me that. I was skinny and blonde and probably needed a bath more than a shave <laughs> go for it use the pink shaver you watched me might as well shave your arms too while you're at it you got this i feel like i flew up a set of stairs so we must have been living in one of the duplexes then with another family i shaved it was satisfying lathering up with thick bubbly bar of soap then making long paths like a hot wheels car driving down a little dirt road <laughs> till both legs were shiny and clear i was so proud of myself i barely dried off and wrestled with my pjs to get them back on my mom wanted to see even though it was way past my bedtime i stood tall as i walked down the stairs toward the smell of weed and booze to the crowd of people all my fans I smiled about as big as I felt, and I showed her. And she said, 
You shaved your whole arms? <laughs> you were only supposed to shave your armpits. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Everyone laughed. What a dummy. <laughs> People do shave their arms. That's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah. In this case, though, I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> she did say shave your arms. I think I knew that it was only supposed to be armpits, but I was so actually you got I was having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, she did say arms, though. <laughs> and I had seen. I knew better. I knew better. Um, I am going to plug a, a birthday fundraiser that I'm doing for Porn Magazine, and Nomi's going to put it in the uh, chat. It is on um, Facebook, but you can also give other ways. But I would really love for people to support the work of Porn Magazine and learn a little bit more about Porn Magazine. Uh, Poor Press, where my book was published, is a, is a program of Porn Magazine. It's like a um, it's a much bigger thing than just a magazine. It's like uh, it's an indigenous and landless and poor people's uh, movement building um, and I uh, I'm I'm bringing it up now too because I'm about to show you this this little zine here that uh, Stevie put together and um, Roofless Radio we recently did a Roofless Radio um, workshop out at Ensign Road and these are stories of crisis survival and vision from unhoused poverty scholars we did this on June 19th here on the stolen squawks and squally land um, and so this is one of the things that we've been doing. And um, there's a few of us, Bobby, Mark, shout out to you guys. And Stevie and I um, have been meeting and, uh, and doing writing groups together. It's been mostly Bobby and um, Stevie, I'll admit. Um, and, uh, and, and Mark and I too, sometimes me. <laughs> Thursdays, thank you. Yeah, do it. Do it. <laughs> Thursdays when? Thursdays at six o'clock at the YWCA. It's open to anybody with lived experience with poverty, um, homelessness, incarceration, uh, immigration, and uh, come write, tell your story, or just hang out. There's always food. And if you publish, like Lisa did, um, Poor Magazine, we pay people for publishing their stories on Poor Press. Um, or you could even write a book, like Lisa did. Yes. I didn't get paid to write my book, but if yeah. you buy my book, I get paid. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yes. And so, Thank you, Stevie. Yes. I put you. you on camera. And I put the info in the chat. Nice. Oh. Yeah. Great. And also, um, your fundraiser has made $145. Woo, so. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, yes. everybody. Yeah. One of the things that that money might go for is these stipends that we're talking about. So at, at Ensign Road, all these people wrote their stories, and every single person got a stipend. So it's pretty rad there with cold drinks and uh and some food and cash <laughs> and just be like people are writing and sharing their stories and and also it's been really grounding and um and a learning experience to see what crisis means for all different people because even being going to people school we talk about crisis there too and and how how very very different crisis is if you are unhoused <laughs> than if you are housed and then every single bit of um uh access to uh, how our needs being met, uh, how it makes things different. And it's very different when you're like, I don't know what we're gonna eat. We gotta go borrow a sandwich. Like that's, yeah, it, it, it definitely alters our DNA, I think, um, growing up poor. And people are still experiencing poverty. So my love to everyone who, um, who anyone here that, participated in this and everyone who participated in this who is not here right now because um, I'm just so grateful. So we will continue to meet on Thursdays um, and we will probably do some more uh, some more of these uh, workshops out of the out of the meeting space. But like uh, Stevie said, six to seven thirty on Thursdays. I'm there probably two times a month. <laughs> I have some other commitments on Thursday nights. Um, um, and I am so grateful that you're holding that down, Stevie formerly in-house poverty scholar. I'm just grateful for this circle around me and everybody out there. Um, we're getting closer to uh, to like a quarter two. Should I do my, should I do a last piece or just song? Uh, yeah, maybe one more piece and then some Q and A. Yeah, let's do that. And then you guys can talk and stuff like that. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna oh, read. Somebody asked for, oh. Andrea and Marty asked for I can tell. Oh, nice. Thank uh, you, Marty. Yeah. I had that one highlighted. I really wanted to read that. I feel like every time I write a book, I want to have a piece that maybe doesn't quite fit in the description, 
but I'm mad and I'm just going to say some stuff. Mm. And I feel like uh, even though it didn't quite fit, because it was one of the ones that nobody was like, it doesn't quite fit. You were helping me as as my editor. And I was like, and, and then Marty said it was his favorite piece. And I was like, it's going in. Marty <laughs> said so. <laughs> um, and then also, I feel like we have to leave room for anger. We have to leave room for anger, especially if we're talking about things from our childhood. That little kid like can be mad <laughs> and, and be a part of us and be part of me. So anyway, I, I got mad one day and I wrote this piece. <laughs> it's called I Can Tell. I Can Tell. You can tell the people who have never scrubbed public toilets for an hourly wage. <laughs> I can tell the people who have never went hungry, missed a meal because poverty. When we were kids, extension cords and a nice neighbor and keeping a good rapport were the things that could save us when the electricity got cut off. I'm glad there are lots of people who have never had to miss meals because there wasn't any, not even once. People who are never malnourished because there wasn't enough. I'm glad there are people who always had access to food, like lifelong. You never even had to think about not having that resource, especially not as a kid. Food was provided, a given, always there, like breathing. I'm glad there are people who have always been housed. Some of you lived in the same house the whole time you grew up, your whole life. Never been evicted. Never had someone not renew your lease. Never didn't know where you'd stay that night because there was no place to go because you couldn't afford it. Always had housing stability. Never even had to think about it. I'm glad there are people like that. And sometimes you all are very frustrating, like frustrating as fuck. <laughs> yes. Still like me? <laughs> There's Dandelion. Hi. Oh. <laughs> He's what a good us. Boy. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Marty, for that request. Shani, hey. Access support through the book. Shani. All right. I am going to read this piece. Doodly doodly do. Uh, da, da, da. I'm going to read two real quick. I'm going to read Alone Together and then I'm going to read Escape yeah. the Blueberries. And then Alone Together. This piece is called Alone Together. I made it to the seventh grade into a junior high where I had attended four out of the five elementary schools that funneled kids there. The first day of school came and went with ease. I was established instead of new. And dare I say, popular? I, practiced, I practically danced home past our neighbor's huge houses, tidy flower beds in early autumn bloom, fresh cut lawns, literal picket fence, to find my mom defeated on the couch. Mm. I'm sorry, legs, I tried. We gotta be out of here by 8 a.m. tomorrow. I don't know where we're gonna go. We're out of places to go, my exhausted mama sobbed. I stood there a moment, my school book still in my hands. The clock was ticking, such a rare occasion. My mom and I alone together. I'm done, I said to my mom as I scooped the coins from the table she was slumped over. I'm gonna go get Marty from the bus stop, I said. I gathered up what little we had into a pillowcase, homework, toothbrushes, soccer stuff, and walked away. What are we gonna do, Marty asked. Call Grandma Ganser, I said confidently. People just kept passing by, driving home from work. The cars and trucks seemed fresh off the lot. As we walked to the nearest payphone, my mind was, I heard the familiar growl of my brother's stomach. How was school? I asked. I was making decisions for both of us that would impact us for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Mm. I'm going to read the last piece of the book called Escape to the Blueberries, which includes a little singing part. So you got a couple <laughs> singing parts. You know, yeah. remember when I was a singer in that band called Punky Bruiser? I think Kelly's here. Hey, Kelly. Kelly played bass in Punky Bruiser. That was in the early 2000s. I can't remember. Sometime. We did it. It was fun. Okay. Escape to the Blueberries. For a while as a grown up. Hi, Dandelion. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little amped. I'm a little. Oh, this one's a little down. What a good boy. <laughs> Thank you, Dandelion. For a while as a grown up. I would run errands for my mom. I'd help her keep her bird cage clean, take out her garbage, make sure she had what she needed. 
I even brought her pot a few times. I could see what she was getting. wasn't right. I I would grocery shop for her. It always took so long because her lists were all over the place. And she'd send me into Cub, this big grocery store over by Northtown Mall. Sometimes I'd pitch in a few bucks, get her things that weren't on the list, special treats. I was trying to get her to eat less processed food and also not take away the choices she was making. She had a hard time keeping weight on, disabled and chronically ill. She got foods that were easy to make. There were organic blueberries on sale and they tasted delicious. So I got her a pint. When I got back to my mom's apartment, I had to rush off after putting away her groceries instead of sticking around like I usually would. Later, I saw that she sent a couple texts and also tried to call. Legs, I gotta talk to you about the blueberries, she said. I was thinking, uh-oh, maybe she didn't know what to do with them or was upset because they're expensive. I texted that I paid for them and that I was sorry for getting things not on the list. She said she couldn't text about it. She had to talk to me. So I called her. She told me a story the way she once in a while would, a vibrant, colorful story of her childhood that was not about the trauma. It was the balm for the trauma. Eating those blueberries straight from the package brought my mom back to the last time she remembered eating blueberries. Tears welled up to my eyes arms. I've always said that my mom was an unrealized poet. And you know what? Maybe my favorite poet without ever having written one poem. I wrote this poem for my mom's story. Please run free, little girl. Knock need, summer breeze. Michigan by the water. Face and hands stained purple blue. Tummy so full, almost sick, you said. Running, laughing, escaped to the blueberries. You are healed. You are the sword you wield. You are meant to be exactly how you are right now, to be free. I wrote the following lyrics on the plane. 10 days after Nomi's mom, Melinda, died, Nomi and I were on our way to so-called Coon Rapids to pull my mom off life support. 10 days between two matriarchal deaths. Sometimes the tools we use, we choose to survive take our lives and I thought that you and I would have more time rest in power mom Sandra Sam Ganser born September 20th 1951 and left to join the ancestors on October 7th 2017 and that's the last piece of the book I didn't read the whole book thank you for being here thank you for um everyone who's here i'm so glad stevie's idea to have a couple people here and then to um open and close in a prayerful way just like having you guys here is very yeah and everyone i start crying when i saw who was here so um we have a like six minutes and we want to leave a couple minutes for nomi's closing so is there any like questions or comments or um I see Kalana's hand. Yeah. When, when, when's your next book coming out? Oh, ha ha. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. When's your book coming out? Yeah, when's your book coming out, Kalana? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have thought about, I have thought lately about making like a kind of chat book of all the articles I've written for Poor Magazine and putting them into one book, which well, that might be kind of cool, I think, because I've written a lot of articles about loved ones who have been lost to police violence. So people who have been murdered by the police and uh, I dive pretty deep in that work. I, um, uh, you know, some of y'all are here on the call, I see. And so um, I kind of feel like what I do is I become friends with the person who was murdered and I get to know them. And uh, and I think for the families, that'd be cool if there was another place where they are. There are they'll also be back. What is that? An awful smell coming from the. <laughs> Those animals that live llamas. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see Carol has her hand up. Okay. All right. Did I finish my thought or something? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi. Um, hi, Lisa. Hey. Um, I think. I think this would really work well as like a staged reading. I'd love to see, um, you know, what you what you read tonight. Those those pieces from your book, which I I had bought and read. So y'all, I hope y'all do that same thing. Um, and um, 
yeah, and maybe other people's work together. I think I'd make a, a, a really powerful stage reading at some point oh. when we have stages again <laughs> for those of us that can yeah. that have the uh, thank you the ability to do that. Yeah. Thank you for, for maybe reading we this. could set up something out in the Bay Area, you know? Like, yeah, is it yeah. my backyard? My backyard. Yeah. I like standing in your back. Yeah, we could do it in your backyard. Yeah, that would be amazing. Thank you, Carol. You're one of my favorite writers, so. We've sat in writing circles before. I know that purple is your favorite color. And anyway, uh, thank you. You helped support my writing too, because I came and visited when I finished the book and I got to stay at your place. So thank you. Um, and does anyone else have any? Hi, I'm, I'm, am I unmuted? Good. Okay, hey. I'm Diane from, from St. Paul. Oh, hey. And hi. So um, in like late nineties, early 2000s, um, my sister, my older sister, um diagnosed with bipolar with yeah a lot of stuff there and so I kind of like I lost my sister and mm. um it's been an ongoing process but like Lisa from afar came like kind of like my sister and I we've never I don't think we've ever really met in person but like I followed you through like you know funky bruiser and mm. and and I remember one time you were on the bus and you're talking I was like oh I want to introduce myself you know cha 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 but like you've got like watching, like being part like of your Facebook and Instagram and like being part of your, I feel like being part of your life with like with Naomi and how much you share is just so important, like the, the cooking of food and growing food. And I just get so much out of this book because I, I know what it feels like to be on welfare and how food is such an important fun thing among siblings when there isn't enough and we can bond over it. And it's just, I connect so much with your book and I'm just, I'm so grateful that you're on this earth and all the work you do and, and know me and everything. So, um, and with that, I'll pass. Thank you. Thank Happy you. birthday, by the way. Hey, tell me, tell me your sister's name. Um, Lynette. Lynette. Yeah. Yes. She's with us too. Yeah. She is. Yeah. yeah. A bipolar ancestor. Thank you for telling yes. me about Lynette. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm gonna be in St. Paul soon because I'm coming back, uh, coming back to the Anishinaabe territory because uh, my cousin Kim's daughter is getting married. So um, Nomi and I just booked our tickets yesterday, as a matter of fact. And so well, Nomi booked them. Thank you, Nomi. <laughs> it's my birthday present, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're gonna be coming uh, home. And from, that's Auntie Care Care's grandchild. That's Auntie Care Care's. Yeah. Wow. wow. Full wow. circle. Lisa, okay. someone asked me oh, how it's to get in touch or stay in touch with you. And so mm -hmm. I put your, it's LM Ganzar on Instagram. Is that right? Yes. And then Lisa Ganzar on Facebook. And I don't remember your TikTok handle. Do you? I don't remember. But <laughs> so look for Lisa Ganzar on TikTok. TikTok's very silly. I'm it's just like, really it's me singing adorable. and being silly. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I love yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone being here. I know we only have a, a couple more minutes, but I have invited my partner um, in life and love and one of my favorite people ever, uh, Nomi Lamb, who uh, um, is right here next to me, <laughs> uh, to bring us out in prayer. Um, and I'm just so grateful for all your support for, through this book, babe. Thank you so much. Such a good book. Um, yeah, thank you. This song is... Uh, um, has some Hebrew in it um, and also English and the English is behold how good this is. And it's just a recognition of this moment and um, you know, it was in it and acknowledge how good it is. Yes. And the Hebrew is basically saying the same thing. So behold how good this is. 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 He 
everybody for being here shabbat shalom shabbat shalom oh someone put your tiktok in the chat nice <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be like i make some noises see something adorable <laughs> you can check it out do, 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 do. That's what <laughs> Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Orca Books. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank, Thank you, you, Lisa. Look yeah. at this book. Everyone should get it. It's so good. It's awesome. so awesome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. How do we leave this? Oh. Awesome. Yeah. awesome people. Wow. Look at you all. Wow. Beck Camp. Wow. Laura Love. Wow, oh, so cool. Liberty's here. Yeah. Paula, look at this. Jack, all right. Hi, Ben. This is so exciting. <laughs> Bye, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. I don't know why I can't. I don't want to leave, but I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. I'll see you soon. Yeah. Can I use the restaurant? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. You just go in and to the left. To the left. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Oh, I'm just going to be permanently spotlighted. It won't let me unspotlight myself. <laughs> it looks like we're spotlighted together, though. We are. Look, look, let's, let's lean in. Let's lean in. Oh, I'm I going see. the wrong <laughs> That's weird. That's that was weird. very weird. That was like... Well, I was watching that one, but I think we were actually leaning toward each other on my screen. <laughs> All right. Okay, so Nora, Nora, I'm going to turn the control back over to you now. Oops, I hope I can do that. Let's see. I think I, I got it. It gave it to me. Oh, great. Okay. Awesome. All Thank right. you so much for joining it, for like doing this to me. This is cool. Thank you so much, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> it was really nice to meet you. Thank you so much for all your support. And of thank course, you. of course. Awesome. Okay. I'm gonna hit yeah. the I'm gonna hit the end button. Okay. okay. Have a good night. Have a good birthday. Thank you. Thank again. you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>